Edwin, so um, one of the biggest um, criticisms of um, Bitcoin mining has to be that uh, it's centralized, especially when um, we have this criticism from the Bitcoin maxis that, you know, proof of stake is not going to work, especially with the uh, anticipation of um, Ethereum's proof of stake um, uh, mining you know, thing. And, you know, we say, you know, proof of stake is doomed to fail because, you know, most of the Ethereum people already have most of the coins. So it's obviously going to centralize, you know, before it's doomed to fail. And they, the Ethereum people have this kind of gotcha saying, you know, you know, Bitcoin mining is centralized, the barrier to entry is too high. And um, I kind of see the merit to the argument. So what's your opinion? I've, you know, heard different arguments, you know, regarding that, you know, um, that this argument. So I want to get your opinion on that. I mean, I would just like bluntly disagree with the, the statement that Bitcoin mining is, is centralized. Um, when you look at uh, distribution of hash rate uh, across the world, um, and using sources like I mentioned before, the Cambridge Institute of Alternative Finance, um, some of these larger like data collecting organizations that then put that data out in uh, more digestible ways and charts and visualize it and whatnot. Uh, you can see that, um, especially since the, the ban from China on Bitcoin mining has become more distributed and decentralized. You have massive amounts of hash rate scattered across South America. Um, you have a definitely a significant increase in concentration of hash rate in North America, specifically the United States. But uh, there's still a ton in Northern Kazakhstan where the mining that got shut down in Kazakhstan was in Southern Kazakhstan. This in large part was due to the fact that the government was subsidizing the energy coming in and they didn't really see a reason to pay for people to Bitcoin mine in their country. Um, massive amounts of hash, hash rate in Russia, um, huge amounts of hash rate in Scandinavia. You're starting to see it pop up in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the UAE, I was just at a, the Bitmain conference in November uh, this last year in Dubai. The UAE is getting huge into Bitcoin mining and looking to invest massive amounts. Uh, there's mining in Kuwait. I, I could go on forever. The, the um, hash rate is distributed across the globe amongst many, many different entities, all with an interest in protecting the Bitcoin network and thus their, their, their investment, securing it, I should say. And that, that's an important point to make as well. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it um, due to the financial incentives, which were put intentionally in place to facilitate this system. Um, so if someone were to come to me and say, uh, Bitcoin mining is centralized, I would just ask them to be more specific because I don't, really i wouldn't really know what they mean by that because hash rate is so globally distributed um i mean there's even huge amounts of hash rate in iran uh it i i just honestly i uh i would be very confused if someone came to me and said bitcoin mining is centralized because to me that would just seem that they hadn't done a cursory google search because like a, a simple Google search would come up with data showing you that that's not the case. So um, I get what you mean uh, that, um, you know, there's, there's obviously lots of players across you know, the world that are involved in Bitcoin mining globally. But what about the high barrier to entry that, you know, for it to actually become a profitable miner, you have to, you know, join a mining pool. And basically the mining pool dictate, you know, dictates, you know, you know, the mining pool as a large corporation basically dictates um, the you know the rules of the game along with like alongside with you know other miners and when you compare to proof of stake you know when you when if you accumulate enough coins then you can become i think a delegator in the ethereum proof of stake um, ecosystem do you not see how it compares and kind of makes us a bit you know hypocritical seeing that although you might say you know they scooped up coins early but these people got into mining early and the barrier to mining, you know, to Bitcoin mining is still fairly high. Mm. So I think maybe that's a, a more recent criticism, the barrier to entry side, because, you know, if you look at the market in 2020, uh, you could pick up used machines like S9s, for example, for 20 to 30 bucks a piece. It's not a very high entry uh, a barrier of entry into mining, of course. Uh, as the price of BTC has skyrocketed since then, and mining economics has also reflected that being more profitable, naturally the, the equipment that lets you mine is going to rise in price as well. In fact, I think S9s, and miner S9s outperformed the price of Bitcoin uh, in 2021. So um, 
I would challenge that, especially in comparison to proof of stake for a couple of reasons. Uh, when you look at the, the amount of coins you would have to buy on a proof of stake network to become a delegator like Ethereum, that is extremely expensive as well. I think, what is it like 32 ETH? You would need to be a proof of stake delegator, which, you know, with $3,200 per ETH, it's not exactly a low barrier to entry. And as you also stated, the, the supply has been concentrated, like 90% of the supply has been concentrated in very few hands. Um, and lastly, it just replicates existing, I think, like oligarchical top-down systems. So it's nothing new. Um, but with, um, I think some recent trends in Bitcoin mining have actually uh, demonstrated that there really isn't too high of a barrier to entry to get in because what we've seen uh, over the course of 2021 is a huge kind of at home miner power to the plebs movement. And you have even uh, many companies now popping up where their main clientele is to sell miners to retail and they offer them several options. They can either, um, you know, host their machines in one of their partners facilities so they can get access to cheaper electricity rates so that they can mine profitably, or they can simply buy the machines and have them shipped to their house. And you can see people mining. I mean, if you just go on any social media platform and look for it, you can see thousands and thousands of people mining from home profitably, especially with the newer gen machines that are more efficient than some of the older ones. And I will also say that I know we brought up Venezuela earlier. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of the hash rate in Venezuela isn't coming from these like large institutions uh, that have, you know, 100 megawatt data centers. They're, they're at home miners. They're people that have one to five devices in their basement because their currency is worthless. And this is how they preserve their wealth and actually make a living for themselves and their family. So um, I think to make a statement like Bitcoin mining has too high of a barrier of, of entry um, means you probably have some blinders on and you're only looking at like the most new machine that's most recently come out that of course is going to command the highest price, like, you know, $10,000 per device. You're not looking at some of the used hardware that you can get a hold of and still mine profitably. Um, and of course, you know, anyone's going to have challenges as they scale up getting into it. But I wouldn't say it's any more difficult than building a business or investing in really any other industry. Um, I think maybe some of that comes from the fact that, you know, uh, if you're a single retail miner, you can't just spin up a petahash at the snap of your fingers without putting a decent amount of money into it and finding a place to actually put those machines would probably be difficult for a smaller miner like that. Um, but in, in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't say it's that difficult at all. There's many avenues to pursue for this. You mentioned that there's two major um, mining machine manufacturers, but I've heard of other manufacturers as well. Do people actually buy or do they still produce miners or, or why do you only say that there's only two manufacturers? Um, so there are other mining devices, whether they be, whether it's GPU mining or ASICs for other networks like Zcash that are available. Of course, most of those are made by Bitmain as well. But um, uh, the reason why I only mentioned those two is because, you know, uh, in practice, if you have some investment and you're looking to spin up a a decently sized Bitcoin mining operation, you essentially inevitably are going to have to interact with those two entities in whether it's short term and maybe you don't go with the deal with them and you go with Kanan or something, but um, pretty much anyone who gets into Bitcoin mining touches Bitmain or MicroBT at some point and they dwarf the size of any of their competition. Hopefully uh, Intel is going to change that. Um, I suppose when it comes to the this uh centralization criticism uh that jerry mentioned uh, I, uh from my thoughts i guess wouldn't it come i guess when it comes from the fact that because obviously you can have um miners in different geographical areas but if they all uh members of one pool then obviously there's some elements of centralization there so i, I know that in the past I, I could be wrong here uh, correct me if i am but in the past i remember there was a mining pool that split into two because there was a concern that they were going to have there was, it was going to be too centralized. I might be wrong. I, 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 maybe I'm just imagining this, but I thought that did happen uh, like a while back. So I guess that's where some of the criticism comes from. Uh, I'm not really going to ask you a question about that because obviously it's pretty straightforward. We have different pools and uh, if any of them get too large, they'll probably split into two, just like uh, like I described. Um, I guess my question for you, something I'm, I find quite interesting is how different mining pools uh, distribute rewards 
Um, oh, I have frozen it, but yeah, how they distribute how they distribute rewards. So um, when it comes to slush pool, uh, how do you guys distribute rewards uh, and amongst the miners? But also like how is that adapted and changed? Because obviously 2010, right? It's been over a decade. So like how I assume it was much more simple in the early days. Like how has that changed and, and why? Like it'd just be interesting to find out about that. Yeah, so just like a quick sentence on the first thing you mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure if it's I don't know sure if it's split or just closed down. I think you're referring to Ghash pool back in like 2014. Um, but I think that's just another example of uh, how miners react and like when a threat like that is posed, it, it's in everyone's best interest to not completely destroy the network they're all profiting from. But uh, two, I will say before moving on is the cost to switch pools. Um, is basically zero and like you can switch all your hash rate over in like 20 minutes to another pool um and it's not going to really cost you anything and pools they're extremely competitive with one another and so you'll probably get a, the same or cheaper rate and um also it's important to note that there are like you know maybe 15 20 major mining pools and then uh you know if they were to act in a bad if someone were to get first they would have to get more than 50 percent of the network hash rate and then they would have to um, be silly enough to attack the network, thus destroying their whole business and incentives and this whole thing they've built up over the years. Um, and if there was any chance of that happening, you would just see hash rate move from that pool immediately to other ones. And they would no longer be able to do that. Um, in terms of your uh, the, the payouts question in regards to slush pool, it's actually the same payouts we've done uh, since 2010. It's called the we call it score scoring system and uh, basically you um, you point your machines at a uh, our stratum you have a pool account where these machines as workers are attached to and um, when the pool finds a block it then uh, evaluates your score basically how your average hash rate over a specific period of time and then based on that score it distributes a reward to you from that block proportional to your contribution to the pool so if you, to make it simple, if you contribute 10% of the pool's hash rate, you will, you will receive 10% of that block's reward um, minus a small fee um, for, for the service. So um, it's actually unique in that we were the only pool that actually has this payout mechanism. Um, one of its advantages is you don't ever really need to worry where the coins are coming from is they go directly from the coin-based subsidy with transaction fees to slash pool wallet to your wallet. Um, so it's based like the shortest transaction history you can really have unless you've solo mined. Um, and yeah, it, it hasn't changed, I guess, is the short answer to that question. Oh, that's interesting because I um, I guess like in, in theory, what I'm thinking here, which I feel like in practice isn't going to work, but you can tell me. <laughs> in theory, I'm thinking like, hey, if I'm a miner, say I could... Um, yeah, I feel like this is going to work, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I could be a part of Slash Pool, and then obviously I could gain from the rewards. Um, but then if my specific machine mines a block, could I not then somehow lie and say, oh, I did, yeah, yeah, I did. I'm just trying to think, like, is there a way that someone could gain the system? Like, obviously, they could uh, be a part of your pool and then maybe change over to another pool just before they happen to mine a block uh, on you know, on, on, I'm, just, I'm trying to think of a way that essentially there's a weakness, but I guess, um, is there anything that stands out as like a glaring weakness in, in, in practice uh, like that? Have you, have you come across any people trying to actually gamify and, and sort of like abuse the system or is it generally been quite straightforward? Uh, it's very straightforward because effectively the pool becomes the miner, right? So, and, and there's no way to determine that you're about to mine a block. So you wouldn't be able to like switch off. You only know once you've actually mined it. Um, and you, know, you can check, you can look at the, the GUI of your miner and there's a place that's under blocks found. And you can usually, it's like a one there. I've never seen one that says two, um, but uh, uh, so you can, you know, celebrate. It's like a nice Easter egg. Yay, my, my miner was the one that found the block, but it is always distributed to all miners on the pool. Um, otherwise the uh, incentives to join a pool would probably crumble very quickly. If someone had figured out a way to do that, um, it would probably be very chaotic, just pure chaos right now. So say, I feel like, um, I think what I was thinking in my head was like, you, you, your miner specifically would get a block and then you wouldn't declare it to the pool. But obviously what you're saying is that's not necessarily possible anyway. So I appreciate no, that. The, the pool finds the block and then it also, uh, it signs the blocks they find, most do anyways. 
So for every block that slush pool mines, you can look at the Coinbase tag and it'll say slush pool or mined by slush pool. Um, you probably don't have information on like other mining pools, but for slush pool, like how many miners would you estimate are like combining their, their hash power to create slush pools hash power? Uh, actually, you can see that on our dashboard. Um, so let me, it changes throughout the day, you know, as people, some people are doing maintenance, some people turn on and off their machines for other reasons, like if they're on load balancing grid programs, things like that. So if I go to the dashboard here, system statistics, Bitcoin, uh, it's about 180,000 devices on slush pool right now. It's a pretty, uh, pretty good size. What's the, do you know what the biggest, well, do you know what the biggest mining pool is at the moment? Uh, I believe at the moment it's foundry. Uh, besides like making, you know, like more powerful ASICs, like what are the other advances that, that are being made in the mining industry right now? I've heard of like Stratum version two and, and things of that nature. Could you kind of explain that to us? Yeah, so um, uh, Stratum V2 is a mining protocol, so it'd be on the software side. Um, Slush Pool uh, was basically to, uh, as more and more people in the early days uh, plugged in miners and more and more hash rate came online, to the network, there were some scaling issues because previously miners connected directly to uh, the Bitcoin daemon uh, for mining. And then pools came along and there was this sort of like open source Git work protocol, but it didn't necessarily scale well with the exponential increase in hash rate that kept coming online. So what Slushable did back in 2012 was uh, release Stratum V1, which is a pooled mining protocol. Also, we open sourced it. So uh, every single mining pool in existence today runs some form of implementation of Stratum V1. Um, it's always been kind of a big part of what we do as a company. It's uh, open source software for Bitcoin mining and in the open source Bitcoin core spirit. Um, and so Stratum V2 can be seen uh, as an upgrade to Stratum V1 because at the time in 2012, no one could have foreseen the Bitcoin network being where it is today. And uh, naturally, because of that, there needs to be some things uh, that are upgraded so that it can continue to scale, um, you know, decades into the future. So you don't have to deal with problems down the line. Um, so basically the improvements for V2, uh, which is another brains um, slush pool proposal is in there's increased security. Um, there's uh, more efficiency, sort of it's data load transfers. And the third aspect, which is probably the one that's most talked about, is referred to as job negotiation. And the idea behind job negotiation is to shift uh, power away from mining pools and put more of that back into the hand of the individual miners. Surprise, surprise, a pool is actually creating this initiative. Um, and what this allows, uh, right now, mining pools are the ones that submit the block templates. So they decide which transactions go in each block. And there's obviously an incentive to make sure um, you know, the highest value transaction fees are put into the block because that way there's a higher reward. They can distribute a higher reward to more miners. There's more of an incentive for miners to join their pool. So everyone's trying to get the highest uh, transaction fees to put into the next block. But instead of the pool just doing all this, what we uh, job negotiation does is allows uh, individual miners connected to Stratum V2 to submit their own block templates. So they can say, hey, this is my block template. Um, these are the set of transactions that I want to submit should the pool find a block. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's called negotiation for a reason. The pool can reject it, for example. But if the pool does reject it, they can then take that to another pool because one of the features in V2 is zero and backend switching. So you can pretty seamlessly and instantly switch between stratum URLs of different pools. Um, so that's kind of uh, the feature that most people talk about, which would allow miners to select the transaction sets themselves as opposed to relying on the pool to do so, which has all sorts of advantages. Um, so that's kind of the software, more open source Bitcoin mining infrastructure. It's a mining protocol. Um, and yeah, that answers your question. So that's one of the innovations coming into the space. Um, other ones, innovations do also revolve around hardware. They're not necessarily just more efficient chips, but uh, some innovations in like immersion cooling to keep the chips cool so that you can uh, basically run these machines at higher frequencies, um, higher power limits, and thus produce more hash rate. Um, so that's becoming cheaper as like 
there's some innovations in coolant and the way they get set up is before they're really expensive to build. Now the cost of building them is coming down. Um, and then also the form factor of some of these devices. But yeah, um, those would be the, the hardware and software side are kind of the main things for mining right now, but it's pretty straightforward. <laughs>